So we're here with uh, Professor Richard Wolf, host of Demo uh, Economic Update, Democracy at Work, and uh, we're going to talk about his old uh, classmate, uh, <laughs> Janet Yellen, and he went to school uh, together at Yale. And, you know, I thought that they were on it, right? So this is what Janet Yellen used to say about inflation. Is there a risk of inflation? Um, I, I think there's a small risk, and I think it's manageable. I don't anticipate that inflation is going to be a problem, but it is something that we're watching very carefully. Oh, so they're watching it very carefully, so they're on top of it. They're watching it very carefully, so nothing to worry about. And now, here, now here's what she says. Well, um, look, I, I think I was wrong then about um, the path that inflation um, would take. As I mentioned, there have been unanticipated and large shocks to the economy that have boosted uh, energy and food prices and um, supply bottlenecks that have affected our economy badly that I didn't at the time didn't fully understand. So what she's saying is I what happened was I was watching it very carefully and then I had to pee. And then when I got back, the economy's all inflated. I, I don't know what happened. Uh, so for those of you who aren't economists, the way it works is each fiscal quarter, Janet Yellen pokes her head out from her burrow at the <laughs> Fed. And if she sees her shadow, we have six more months of inflation. <laughs> That's how it works. But I, honestly, I'm amazed to hear anybody in the federal government uh, say the words, I think I was wrong. That is uh, the, even the they won't even say that in Nuvaldi. Right. So it's just amazing to hear her say that. So let me bring in uh, Professor Richard Wolf. What do you have to say about this? Well, you know, uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, Janet Yellen and I were graduate students getting our PhDs in economics at Yale at about the same time, many years ago. Uh, but it does mean that I know that she knows what we all learned in the same classes. She had the same professors I did, went through the same graduate program that I did. So I do know that she knows that there are other ways of dealing with the inflation than the ones that she and her boss pretend are the only conceivable thing to do. Now that the inflation you did not foresee, and nobody has perfect foresight, so uh, give her that space. She didn't see it coming. Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> but now that it's been here and been here a long time and shows no sign of disappearing anytime soon, isn't it your job to make the American people, you're the Secretary of the Treasury, your former Fed head, you know, make the people aware there are alternative mechanisms for dealing with inflation and different ones will impact different people in different ways. That decision has to be made. And in a genuine democracy, it would be made with lots of public discussion about the pros and cons of the alternatives. None of that is being done. We're being asked to go on with the one what that they're looking at, raising interest rates, which, as I said, wax all debtors. And yet she was wrong, she admits to her credit. What about the possibility that she's wrong again with this focus on one mechanism to the total exclusion of even admitting the existence of the others? They're not going to ever do that. Right. They're not going to ever do the things. No. They're committed to doing the same old activity they always did. Look, th that, this is standard stuff. You have an inflation, you raise interest rates. You hope that that works. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. But it's not the only thing. It's why Roosevelt and Nixon and there are many other examples in, in the world took much more serious steps. They felt they had to act and act quickly. The American people, I believe, want to, someone to act quickly to stop this inflation, not to go the conventional route, which may or may not work, which may take 6, 12, 18 months. Uh, that's what the people want. They're not doing that. They're doing the same old stuff. Just like what you took us through, reading that verbiage, those that's the words that is written during the campaign. This is what we're for. And then it's all forgotten and thrown out. 
the minute the election is over, when they get down to deal with their realities. It is a tragedy that this country's economic situation for the vast majority continues to deteriorate because nothing dramatic is done as if our problems are all the kind that a slow repetition of what we've done in the past will somehow magically solve. So I, I have one question I want to ask you. I can't. So I tour around and I stay at hotels all the time and still hotels don't provide a lot of services like they won't like in a hotel that's supposed to have a restaurant. They won't they won't be serving food. Or they won't have room service. Or they won't. They say it's because of COVID and a labor shortage. And I've even seen comedy clubs uh, that open up and uh, they'll, they'll have like, oh, we're only doing half service because we can't find kitchen help. So we're instead of having two hundred people in here, we're only going to have a hundred people because we can't find the kitchen help. And I've had other people say, yeah, I can't fi find a dishwasher. And so I always say to them, well, how much did you raise your pay? And exactly. they, they never say they raise their pay. I'm like, well, isn't that how capitalism is supposed to work? When something's in demand, the price goes up. So labor is in demand. You're supposed to raise the pay until you get enough workers. And then you right. raise, then they go, well, I can't make money. Well, don't you, you raise the price of your product so you can pay your workers and keep your product. That's, that's how it's always worked, but it doesn't seem it's working that way right now because of coronavirus. What, tell me what's going on really. What's going on is this accumulation of problems. You're exactly right. That's how it's supposed to work. It isn't working. There is no labor shortage. There's a shortage of people because you're not willing to pay. We have a lower labor force participation rate than we had five years ago. There's a reason for that. People are not going to work. That's why we have rates of quitting that we've never seen before. That's why we're having the rise of people wanting a union, the rise of people going on strike. We have all the evidence you could possibly want that there's something fundamentally wrong. If it's true what you've been told, Jimmy, that we can't hire workers because we can't pay them more and we can't raise the price that would ever allow us to pay them more, then what you're hearing is that the capitalist economic system is busted. That's right. It can't function. It cannot solve the basic problems. And you can keep talking about supply chain disruptions and other mysticisms, but you've got a broken system led by people who cannot say that. You've admired Janet. She had said, I was wrong. She was wrong about predicting inflation. You will never hear those people say they're wrong about believing that the economic system was beyond question, was beyond criticism. They're always finding this particular problem, that one, this excuse, that explanation. They just don't want to ask the question, do we have a systemic breakdown here? Let's talk about it. It isn't going to go away because you pretend not to see it. That's like being a three-year-old who sees a scary doggy, puts his or her hands in front of their eyes, and imagines that if they can't see it, it isn't there. So I just, I'm still flummoxed by, so uh, let's say you, 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 open, you own a restaurant. So I know this for it to be a fact. Someone owns a restaurant. They open up, they can seat 200 people. They're only going to seat 100 because they're not, they can't af get enough kitchen help and they're not raising the price, which I always thought businesses hire if they have orders to fill. And if they have an order to fill, they go hire the people to fill that order. So if you have 200 people ordering a hamburger, but you're only, you're not going to go hire the people to fill that, even if you have to pay more money, you charge more money for your hamburger. They're not, do I've never, ever ever i would imagine that would just would ever happen in capitalism that people are returning down orders because they don't want to pay people to fill those orders is it that's that's just crazy right yeah the one the only thing i would correct jimmy is they can't raise the price that's their problem if they raise the price they can't sell enough to cover their costs 
So they can't do what normally they could have done. So you now have to ask the question, well, if they can't raise the wages they paid and get the workers because they can't raise the price of the hamburger those workers would make, what's the problem? And here comes the answer, and that's going to frighten people. They can't because you have redistributed the wealth in this society. You've given a vast number of people very little. They can't really pay the higher price for the hamburger, the higher price for the French fries, the higher price at the pump for the gas. They can't do it. And they could if you didn't jigger the, the, the system's distribution of wealth, but you have. And so now the people who've got it all, they're not going to spend it. They're busy making investments and having yachts in the Bahamas. The mass of people who would allow the capitalists to function can't do it for him anymore. That's a system problem. You've divided things up in such a way that for the little businessman or woman trying to make ends meet, you've created an impossibility, which is why the guy who runs the restaurant in the hotel you're talking to has that sad look on his face because he's trying to explain to you I'm trapped here. I'm destroying my own future because I can't. That person has to understand he's in a kind of prison. He's got to get out. As long as he stays in that prison, he's going to feel trapped. And that's where we are. And so what and so FDR's answer to what we're going into right now. It was to take money and put it into the pockets of workers to spread to That's redistribute right. the income and give it more to the instead of giving it letting it trickle down, which is what we do now. We give it to the richest people through tax cuts and whatever. Then they're supposed to spend that extra money. They don't because they already have everything they need, and that money never does trickle down. But what FDR yeah. did was he took that money and he put it in the pockets of working people. And what do they do? They immediately spend that money, and it helps the economy, which is why every time. You know, there's a guy who was the CEO of Wetzel's Pretzels. We all know that place. And he used to be against the minimum wage. And then he noticed every time they did raise the minimum wage, his profits went up. And that's because the people who buy his pretzels had more money in their pocket to buy pretzels with. And so now he's for the minimum wage increase because he knows it helps his. And so that's kind of what FDR did on a, on a, a larger scale. You give everybody a raise, right? Absolutely. If you look at a graph. I teach this all the time in the university. If you look at a graph of the distribution of wealth and income in America, the 1930s, the worst time for American capitalism, the collapse of the Great Depression, suddenly the division of, labor, uh, the division of wealth and income is radically altered. It goes from very unequal in the 1920s to way less unequal. And that got us out because the same story you told about the restaurant was told by every business in the 1930s. You had to dramatically alter the distribution of wealth to get the engine running again. And we live in a time which needs that, which is in trouble. We've had three major crashes in the first 22 years of this century each one worse than the one before. We're desperately in need of a major breakthrough, but we have two political parties who can't think for one minute about such questions on a systemic level. And that puts us in a very dangerous place. Well, everybody check out uh, Professor Richard Wolf's show. It's called The Economic Update, Democracy at Work, or check out his latest book, The System is the Sickness, When Capitalism Fails to Save Us from Pandemics or Itself. Thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Jimmy, and I appreciate your program. Here we're doing stand-up comedy in Irvine, California, Las Vegas, San Diego, Salt Lake City, Indianapolis, Louisville, all over the place. Go to JimmyDoreComedy.com for a link for tickets.